Chapter 6 Mary at Nazareth We return to Gabriel. After his visit to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in the temple of Jerusalem, he appears in a private house at Nazareth, about eighty miles to the north of the city. The visit to Nazareth was not immediately after the visit to Jerusalem. There was an interval of six months. Why should there have been an interval? Why did not Gabriel go to Nazareth immediately after he had been to the temple? We are not told, but it was obviously appropriate there should be an interval. John was to go before Jesus. It was fitting, therefore, that John should be born before Jesus, rather than after him or at the same time. The interval of six months allowed of this, and farther, it illustrated the deliberativeness that characterizes all divine ways. As to where Gabriel was between the time he showed himself in the temple, at the right side of the altar of incense, to the time he entered the humble home of Nazareth where Mary dwelt, it is of no moment for us to speculate. He was probably in the neighborhood of the land of Israel, watching with a calm angel's interest the various complicated and busy movements of human life at a time when the cup of Israel's sins was slowly filling to the brim. But whether or no, it concerns us not. What does concern us much is his appearance at Nazareth. He went there on business, affecting us in a way by no means manifest at that time. It was a very small event to have such a mighty significance as it proved to have. It was but a visit and a message to a fair and godly damsel. Fair, we may assume her to have been, by all the laws of human probability. Youth, leisure, culture, and godliness are almost a guarantee of comeliness in the gentle sex. Godly she self-evidently was, from her rejoinders to the angel and her communications to her cousin immediately after. While we could conceive of none but a godly virgin being visited of God to be the mother of the promised deliverer. But we will not think of her as Roman Catholicism has stereotyped her. Mary has been metamorphosed by tradition into a goddess, with whose figure, sculptor and paintings, have made the benighted populations of Europe as familiar as with those of Venus and Apollo. It requires not to be said that there is no more reality about the Madonna of ecclesiastical art than about the mythical gods of Greek polytheism. The portraits of Mary are as unhistorical as those of Christ. They are the gloomy fancies begotten of the doleful theology of the cloister. When we see Christ and Mary, as we shall at the resurrection, if we are honored with an accepted place there, we shall behold the personages of a very different type from the insipid, lugubrious presentments of the brush and chisel at the hands of men who only knew the ignoble religion of the priests. It will be an endless marvel to Mary that she had been idolized for ages in such a caricature of her own clear and fervent intelligence. The piety of Romish superstition is a very different thing from the godliness of an ardent Israelite, man or woman. Heavy and gloomy and mawkish is the one, bright and joyful and noble as the other. Why this visit to Mary? What she said immediately afterwards, and what Zachariah said three months afterwards, inform us. Mary said it was, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Zechariah, that the Lord God of Israel might do as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began. This throws us back upon the promises made unto our fathers. What those were, as bearing upon this matter, we have seen in a former chapter. They condense into the single sentence of Zechariah that God would raise up an horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. This promise presupposes the need for it, which we discover in the Bible history of man. Sin separated man from God at the beginning. Sin brought Israel into evil in all their generations. God's purpose was to effect reconciliation, redemption, and deliverance on a plan that required that the Deliverer be a son of David, a son of Abraham, a son of Adam, as well as the Son of God. The moment had arrived to bring this Deliverer on the scene. The angel Gabriel arrived with that moment to announce the event 
in the right quarter. Not in China, not to a Scythian or Roman woman, but in the land of Israel to a virgin of the house of David. The proof that Mary was of the house of David need not trouble us long. The promise requires it, for if Mary were not a descendant of David, then was Jesus not of the seed of David according to the flesh, for he had no actual human father. Then the coexistence in the apostolic narrative of the two lines of descent from David involves the certainty that one of them, Luke's, was Mary's. For it is not conceivable that two mutually incompatible genealogies could have found currency among believers in the first century with apostolic sanction, as these two accounts undoubtedly did. They are mutually incompatible if they are both Joseph's, but they are not so if one of them is Mary's. They are in that case two coordinate pedigrees, both correct and both germane to the case. That Mary does not appear by name in either of them is not a difficulty when we remember that it had ceased to be a custom at the time these genealogies were drawn from the public registers to recognize the female element in the genealogy. If the woman were an important link, she appeared either by her husband or other male relation. In this case, she appears by her father. Heli was Mary's father, and Heli is the first link in the chain of descent given by Luke. This is somewhat obscured by the ambiguous parenthesis with which the chain starts. The parenthesis relates to the popular impression that Joseph was the father of Jesus, but in the common version, the parenthesis is made smaller than it really is. It consists of the words, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. The common version limits the parenthesis to the words, as was supposed, and creates the obscurity. The obscurity is at an end if we read Luke as having said, And Jesus himself began to be about thirty years of age, being, as was supposed the son of Joseph, but in reality, of Heli, who was of Mathat, etc. There would remain then but the simple question why Joseph's genealogy should be given, since Joseph was not the father of Jesus. This seems sufficiently answered by the reflection that there would have been legal confusion in Christ's relation to David if Joseph, the husband of his mother, had not also been of Davidic extraction. In the eye of the law, husband and wife are one, and if Joseph had not been of David, he would have eclipsed and marred the Davidic relation of Mary. Joseph, in his own right, as a descendant of Solomon, could have imparted a title clear to David's throne. But Joseph was not to be the father of Jesus, though he was to be the husband of his mother and the legal father only of her son. The case was totally exceptional and peculiar in all its bearings, and the difficulties and necessities of it were beautifully harmonized in Joseph and Mary being independently related to David through separate lines of descent. One, Joseph, through Solomon, and the other, Mary, through Nathan, thus uniting in themselves the royal rites of David's house, which passed by law and blood to their wonderful son. The angel entered the house where Mary was. It is highly improbable that the site of this house is now known to anyone upon the earth. That it was in Nazareth we know. That the priests point out the very spot to interested visitors is no proof that it was there, for among the many distressing things in the present state of the Holy Land, there is none more marked than the prevalence of baseless legends with regard to the localities of scriptural events. It is something to be sure about Nazareth, and quite enough for purposes of historical association. The position of the place is remarkable, whether we consider its topography or the estimate in which it was regarded. The latter point is sufficiently illustrated in Nathaniel's question on hearing that Messiah had been found in one belonging to Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It is evident from this that it was a place of no repute. We might also say a place of bad repute, a place at all events that could lend no human luster to Christ. Why should such a place be chosen? Why not Jerusalem, Hebron, or Caesarea? The answer is doubtless to be found in the principle defined by Paul that receives such frequent illustration throughout the course of Scripture. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, 
that no flesh should glory in his presence. Nazareth was among the weak things of the age. It could give no prestige to the work that God was about to do. Therefore, that work would come before men without human claims or recommendations. The glory of God alone would be seen. It pleases him that this should be so. It is reasonable that it should be so. But whatever we may think on this head, it is worth noting how completely such a line of action proves that God is in it. For where and when do men ever act on this principle? It is in the universal disposition of men to lean towards influence and respectability in their enterprises, and to avoid everything of a damaging or even questionable association. The very word Nazareth thus becomes a symbol of the divine nature and origin of the work of Christ, and of the principle upon which divine ends are achieved. Wherein God may have found a work on earth at this time, it will be found that the same principle has been adopted. America has given us the gospel, which venerable and learned England was alone supposed to be possessed of learning enough to discover, and it is in the hands of the poor and the unlearned that its work is being done. Nazareth was off the highway of human traffic. It stands in a secluded part of the Holy Land in its northern section. The seclusion is obtained by the formation of a circle of hills in the heart of the mountain range that bounds the plain of Esdraelon on its northern side. Access to this circle of hills, forming a natural amphitheater, is obtained from the plain by a narrow pathway, which strikes through a cleft in the side of the mountain. The pathway gradually opens out into a valley, which increases in width as the traveler advances, until at last it opens out into an amphitheater of hills, on the northern side of which lies Nazareth, well to the top of one of the hills, a straggling village now, probably greatly reduced from what it was in the days of Christ, having shared in the shrinkage that has befallen everything in the Lord's land in this, the day of its desolation. In this secluded nook, there was greater quiet and simplicity of life than in the busier centers and channels of human activity in more southerly parts of the land. It was fitting that such a quiet place should be chosen as the sphere of the Lord's human life and probation. It was more adapted to a culture of a divine state of mind than the activity of a great city. It is one of the many defects of present civilization that men are too much crowded together, too much occupied, too hurried in their occupation. They are blighted by their mode of life in their very attempt to live. Their minds are enfevered and distorted in the conditions which their struggle for existence imposes upon them. They cannot have that calm and deliberation which are essential to well-balanced development of the powers of body and mind. The result is seen in an endless variety of mental deformity. God will yet remedy these evils. He makes a beginning in Christ, and Christ begins in quiet Nazareth. Gabriel, stepping into the house in this quiet village where Mary was, salutes her in a form of words that surprises and perplexes her. Hail, highly favored! The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Women are accustomed to complimentary salutations. Whether it was as much so in the first century as now may be doubted, though, as human nature is the same, it is probable that the deference shown to the gentle sex in those days would be different only in form and not in sentiment. But there was something in this salutation that made Mary feel it was no ordinary salutation. The impressive appearance of Gabriel and the grave and loving ardor of his manner would impress her with this feeling. She is troubled at his saying. While she is wondering, Gabriel tells her she is to be the mother of a son, whom she is to call Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of David forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary is a sensible, self-composed Israelitish damsel. Though full of faith and love of God, she does not swoon and go into hysterics. She does not pose or ejaculate in the tragic styles of modern effeminacy. She asked the angel how such a thing is possible with an unmarried woman. The angel's answer is a consummate blending of literal accuracy with faultless delicacy. The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, 
and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And therefore that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, the power of the highest. When we have grasped the significance of these phrases, the angel's words tell us all we need to know of the origin and nature of Jesus, the Son of God. In the scientific sense, they cannot be grasped, except in the sense of noting them as expressing what is scientifically unknowable. For this also has come to be a term of the modern system of correct knowledge. The higher types of intellect perceive that there is at the root of all physical phenomena a power or energy that is unknowable as to its nature, mode of subsistence, origin, or source of initiative. They know that there is a power unknowable, an apparent contradiction in terms, yet a mathematically demonstrable proposition. Sufficient that we know the Spirit of God as this unknowable power, a power pervading the universe, in which all things subsist, and by which all things have been made, and that this Spirit is a unity with the Father in heaven, whose wisdom imparts to it that differentiating, organizing power manifest in the diversities and marvels of heaven and earth. The fact of such a power we can know, for we see it in its effects. Its essence and mode of operation are inscrutable, but this is no bar to our recognition of its existence and work. This power of the highest, overshadowing Mary, fertilized the human ovum and started the process of generation which gave to Israel that marvel of human history, the man Christ Jesus, the Son of Mary, the Son of God. The theology of Rome has attached the name the Son of God to the invisible power that gave inception to the babe of Bethlehem. The Son of God became incarnate, according to this theology. The angel's words affix the description, the Son of God, to the holy thing born of Mary. The holy thing born of Mary was a babe of flesh and blood generated from Mary's blood during the ordinary gestatory period of nine months. It was this babe that was declared by the angel's words to be the Son of God. This was in harmony with the whole operation. The invisible power at work was the Holy Spirit, the power of the highest. The result was the Son of God. This is what the angel said, and it is an intelligible declaration, and it must have been made to be intelligible. The idea of a pre-existing son, incarnate or embodied in a flesh son of Mary, has been erroneously deduced from certain enigmatical sayings of Christ, which may come under consideration in the course of future chapters. Sayings that truly affirm a pre-existing divinity, but that do not stultify the angel's words on the subject. The pre-existing divinity that became incorporate in the man Christ Jesus was the divinity visible in the angel's words, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, which is one with the Father, and made the Son one with the Father also, as his manifestation and the reflex of his mind. The process of which Mary became the subject, in accordance with the angel's words, accomplished this splendid result. That while on the mother's side it gave Israel a Savior, who was a brother in nature, sharing the same weaknesses and susceptibilities, and inheriting equally with them the woe-stricken results of Adam's transgression, in whom, therefore, death could be destroyed in a resurrectionally accepted sacrifice, and so open a way for our return to God through him. On the Father's side, it gave them a man in whom God's name was incorporate, a head and captain of divine wisdom and character, the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. This completeness of qualification would have been unattainable in a mere son of Mary's husband, it required both the elements exhibited in the angel's words. The recognition of both explains all that came after. The neglect of either works confusion. It is not probable that Mary understood anything of this at the time. She appears at various stages of the matter as pondering these things, in the sense apparently of ineffectually trying to make them out. It was characteristic of all the early incidents of the wonderful work that these things understood not his disciples at the first. 
It was natural it should be so. For how could unilluminated fishermen enter into the depths and mysteries of the nature and work of Christ, in which at first they took but a superficial part? That they are exhibited in a state of non-understanding in the early stage is one of many proofs of the artless truthfulness of the narrative. When Jesus was glorified, and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles to equip and comfort and enlighten them in the things of Christ, then they understood and wrote of these things, whereby we also may come to understanding. The angel finished his communication to Mary by apprising her of the condition of her aged and barren cousin Elizabeth, afterwards mother of John the Baptist, adding, With God nothing shall be impossible. Mary, full of faith, had nothing but words of thankful compliance. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, upon which Gabriel departed. Then here is a touch of nature. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city where Elizabeth lived. What woman does not feel that that is just what she would have done under similar circumstances? What livelier theme of interest among them at any time than that of motherhood? And how much deeper would this interest be between two enlightened women of Israel who had just been recipients of information connected with the realization of the hope of the promise that God made unto the fathers from the beginning? The Spirit of God was on them both. Both were embraced in the brooding power that was about to manifest the glory of God in Israel. No wonder, then, that on Mary's arrival at the house and eager salutation of her kinswoman, Elizabeth, by the Spirit, should respond with elated voice, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For, lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed a hint at her husband's dumbness inflicted for unbelief, for there shall be a performance of those things that were told her from the Lord. Mary's rejoinder is beautiful. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Such a mode of communication between the two women has seemed unnatural to some, it can only seem so to such as leave out of sight the presence of the Holy Spirit and the deep and holy excitement peculiar to the incidents that brought about their meeting. With these in view, their utterances not only seem unartificial, but inevitable and most fitting. If people under alcoholic stimulus can speak with a stateliness and an emphasis unusual with them, how much more must the presence of the Holy Spirit impart a glow and elevation of mind that can only find fit expression in the measured and holy cadences of inspiration. We are too liable to judge by the heavinesses of mortal mentality. We are liable to forget that the present position of man, cut off from intercourse and connection with God because of sin, is an abnormal position and can afford a very insufficient conception of the mental state and personal bearing that would come with the abiding presence of the Spirit in the fullness of God's blessing. It is worthy of note how remarkably the foreshadowing of Mary has been fulfilled with regard to the estimate in which she should be held in succeeding generations. It is true it has been Mariolatry. Still, there is the fact that ever since the events of the first century, Mary has been recognized and blessed by the civilized millions of the earth as a favored woman in having been the mother of the Lord Jesus. Doubtless, her words relate more particularly to the blessedness that will attach to her in the age to come, when the gathered generations of the righteous. Chapter 7 Bethlehem Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months. It was natural she should stay with her a considerable time. The occasion was not one of ordinary visitation. Mary and Elizabeth were relatives, but it was not the interest or the claims of relationship that brought them together, as we have seen. They had been apprised of the stirring and stupendous fact that the hour had arrived for the incipient commencement of that manifestation of the glory of God to Israel and the whole earth, which had been for so long a time 
the expectation of the nation, and that they, too, were to be used in the work. It was this that brought Mary in haste from Nazareth to the hill country in the neighborhood of Hebron, and it was this that led her to stay a much longer time than ordinary circumstances would have suggested. It would naturally be the theme of much interested communication between the two, and as they busily plied the needle together in the preparations inseparable from the prospect before them, the time would go swiftly by. At the end of the three months, John was born. Mary left her cousin just before or after that event. It is more probable she would stay to see it over than come away just before. At all events, close upon the time, she returned to Nazareth to prepare for her own coming experience. The narrative of events relating to Mary and Jesus from this time onwards to the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in the Jordan is very meager. There is no cause for much regret about this. The facts important to be known, those glanced at in the previous chapter, are clearly and amply set forth. The domestic incidents coming after would be interesting, but they are by no means essential, and perhaps might even hinder the right apprehension of the divine aim and intent in the work of Christ, of which the early domestic phase was but the necessary preparation. We know enough, however, to sufficiently complete the picture. The materials jointly furnished by Matthew and Luke enable us to fill in with tolerable fullness the gap that would otherwise exist between Mary's return to Nazareth and John's advent on the banks of the Jordan. Their narratives are usually imagined to be discrepant. They seem so to unfriendly readers, and perhaps to some that are not unfriendly. But they are not really discrepant. They are at the most but variant. They exhibit different aspects of the same matter. While coinciding in the main points, they supply incidents omitted by each other, and thus appear to tell a different story, while they are but telling different parts of the same story. Those different parts admit of each other. They appear to exclude each other only on one point, that is, as to where Joseph and Mary went with the newborn Messiah after their visit with him to Jerusalem to perform the circumcision, whether to Egypt or to Nazareth. But this also will be found capable of such a suggested adjustment as to admit of the implicit reception of both accounts without any alteration. The joint narrative shows the following sequence of events. Mary, though unmarried, was under a spousal to Joseph, her future husband. We are not informed whether she had made him acquainted with the angel's communication to her on the subject of the coming birth of the Messiah. It is possible that maidenly modesty imposed on her an entire reserve with reference to the subject. If this were not so, if she frankly explained to him what had taken place, then Joseph did not, and could not believe her, but attributed her condition to the only cause he could recognize. It was the occasion of extreme embarrassment and dismay to both Joseph and Mary. Joseph was a just man. He could not pass over the serious breach of behavior that had evidently occurred. At the same time, his love inspired pity. If he must part with his intended wife, he would do it privily. He was not willing to make her a public example. Her whole previous character would prompt him to spare her as much as possible. While he thought on these things, and while probably both he and Mary were deeply suffering from the peculiar situation, they were relieved of their distress in the only way possible in the circumstances. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This intimation would not only end a painful dilemma, it would also serve to strengthen the foundation upon which the knowledge the divine sonship of Jesus rested. For now, not only Mary, but Joseph also, was made aware of the fact on the testimony of God, and no room was left for human tradition or for a merely humanly acquired conviction on a subject so all-important. Joseph, thus enlightened, and delivered from what must have been an almost killing embarrassment, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not 
till she had brought forth her firstborn son. How long they kept loving company thus at Nazareth is not exactly apparent. It would be several months. What is especially interesting is this, that whereas it was written in the prophets that Christ would come out of the town of Bethlehem where David was, here was a position of affairs that seemed to make it certain that Jesus would be born at Nazareth and would thus be lacking the initial proof of the Messiahship. It would have been difficult at the moment to suggest how this was to be prevented. The providence of God was at hand to prevent the threatened miscarriage. A decree was promulgated from Rome, ordering the enrollment of the population of the empire with a view to taxation. This decree took every Jew for the time being to his ancestral home. All went to be enrolled, every one into his own city. It thus took Joseph to Bethlehem, where lay the hereditary family connection with the soil, and where, therefore, his enrollment would have to be effected. It took Mary there also, which is one of the proofs of Mary's Davidic extraction. For had she been of another house than the house of David, there would have been no need for her to go to Bethlehem, the city of David. And had it been unnecessary for her to attend for the purposes of the enrollment, it is inconceivable that Joseph would have subjected her to the fatigues of Syrian travel at almost the last stage of pregnancy. He would have gone alone, leaving Mary in the quietude and repose of Nazareth, exerting himself for an expeditious accomplishment of the enrollment business at Bethlehem, and a quick return to Nazareth. But he took her to be taxed, enrolled, with him in the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. He took her because it was necessary for her to go, for she also was of the house and lineage of David. And thus, compliance with a legal necessity of human origin for her presence at Bethlehem at that particular time was the providential means of bringing about conformity with that higher necessity that the Son of God and Son of David should be born at Bethlehem. It is worth while pausing to consider this peculiar combination of circumstances. Manifestly, it was a triumph of divine supervision that secured, by the operation of natural circumstances, the presence of Mary at Bethlehem at just the short particular period during which Christ should be born in the city of David, his human ancestor. But it might seem to a certain view of the case as if it would have been a more complete and natural realization of the divine purpose on this point if Mary had been a resident of Bethlehem instead of a visitor and under no need to be regulated so as to secure the right birthplace for her son. It might plausibly be argued that such an arrangement would also have been much more likely to secure attention afterwards for Jesus at the hands of the nation than one that threw a veil over his Bethlehem parentage, associating him with Nazareth, and thus preventing the easy recognition of the fulfillment in him of the prophecy that Christ should be born at Bethlehem. No doubt, the residence of Mary in Bethlehem would have been effectual on these two points, but then other points would have been interfered with. In our last chapter, we were able to recognize the need for Jesus being insulated from all human prestige, Jewish or Gentile. He was to be rejected of the nation, and his work was to stand upon a divine basis purely, which two things necessitated his association with an obscure Galilean village, of which no one had a good opinion. In view of this, we can see why Jesus should not be known in his lifetime in connection with the royal city. At the same time, it was a prophetic necessity he should be born there. It is here where the providential circumstance we have looked at appears in its true character of consummate wisdom. By a public incident, which had no apparent connection with the purpose of God, the mother of Jesus was brought to Bethlehem at the right moment for the birth of Jesus, without ceasing her connection with that other city, which had been chosen as the sphere of the Lord's mortal life till thirty years of age. When Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, there was no room for them in the inn. We need not stay to dilate on the difference between a modern inn and the institution at Bethlehem designated by that name in the English version. The difference would be great in mechanical particulars, but nothing turns on that as regards the significance of the narrative. 
suffice it that the inn, patronized by Joseph and Mary, would be a place of public accommodation like the modern caravanserai of the East, in which the housing and providing of asses, horses, and camels is quite as prominent a feature as the lodging of travellers, a place, therefore, in which there would be very little of the comforts to which the travelling public of the nineteenth century are accustomed. But even such comforts as it had were not accessible to Joseph and Mary. The place was full. Many people had arrived for the purpose of enrollment from various parts of the country before Joseph and Mary, and all the places were taken. There was no room for them in the inn. There does not appear to have been room anywhere else. Bethlehem was their own city. Presumably, they might have friends and acquaintances in the place. If they had, they did not use their hospitality. Probably, the private houses would be full as well as the inn, and Joseph found himself very nearly in the position of the wayfaring man from that very place about fourteen hundred years before, who, arriving on his travels late at Gibeah of Benjamin, not far from Bethlehem, sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took him into his house to lodge, though there was both straw and provender for the asses, and bread and wine for himself and his wife and manservant who were with him. Joseph had probably straw and provender for the asses, bread and wine for his little company, but there was no room for them in the inn. What was to be done? They had to accept the best accommodation they could get under the circumstances. There was an unoccupied corner in the yard or enclosure where the camels and asses were stalled for the night. It was usual for this corner to have a horse or camel in it, but it was empty. It had a manger in it, for which an unexpected use was found. Here, among the hay and straw, and in the midst of the close and stuffy odors of a stable, they settled themselves down for the night, in all likelihood tired out by the fatigue of the previous day's journey. Before morning, Christ is born. Such a lowly beginning to the life of Christ upon earth is an astounding fact. We have been so familiar with it ever since we knew the name of Christ that it fails to strike with the force that belongs to it. A lowlier birth it would be impossible to imagine. Parents lowly, though of noble descent, and forced for the moment into the lowliest position in the city of their kindred, to herd with the ox and the mule which have no understanding, in circumstances offensive to every delicate sensibility and repugnant to the most rudimentary sense of self-respect. What are we to think about it? It is surely easy to read the lesson. Christ, the highest, began the humblest. God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. This mode of operation will not cease to be exemplified till God's own glorious power becomes visibly incorporate and manifest in the vessels of his choice. Who among us, then, need weary or be ashamed of the humbling circumstances meanwhile associated with the truth? It is natural to be ashamed of them, but reason forbids. Who among us can wisely seek the great and honorable things of the present world? It is natural to seek them, but wisdom says, Be content with food and raiment. Be not conformed to the world. Pass the time of your sojourning in fear. If Christ from the very start of his career was conducted with the despised, we may gladly suffer with him on this point during the few days we are here. The reversal that comes with his return to the earth will compensate for all. The sufferings and humiliations of this present time are but a light affliction, working out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The birth of Mary's child, though an incident of no account among the bustling visitors to Bethlehem and unknown to the world at large, was not an insignificant occurrence to the angels, who are sent forth as ministering spirits for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Jesus afterwards said, There is joy among the angels over one sinner that repenteth. If their spiritual interest and susceptibility are so keen as to be made glad by the reformation of one sinner, we may understand the interest they would take in the birth of one who came into the world to save a multitude of sinners. They manifested their interest in a way that has left its mark on the language and songs of mankind. 
They showed themselves outside Bethlehem on the plains. Underneath the star-sparkling sky where a company of shepherds kept watch over their flocks by night. First, one only appeared. The angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The shepherds were thrown into great fear by the unusual spectacle. An angel in his brightness is an impressive and terror-causing sight in the light of day, how much more in the darkness of the night. Their alarm was soon quieted by the angel's comforting words, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. They wonder what tidings this can be. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The shepherds must have been capable of understanding this announcement, or it would not have been made to them. Had it stopped short with the intimation of the birth of a Savior, they might have supposed it to refer to some ordinary deliverer, such as had frequently been raised up in the course of Israel's history, a deliverer from the yoke of their enemies, in this case the Romans, for which many were sighing. But the short addition, which is Christ the Lord, opened out the indefinite prospect of glory connected with the promise of the Messiah. For the understanding of the significance of these words, their acquaintance with the scriptures must have prepared them. To none but such as are prepared does the Lord's further revelation come. In their intense and painfully roused attention, they gave heed to a further announcement that practically connected the angel's glad message with things they could see and handle. All God's genuine messages are of this realistic character. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The angel knew about the clothes that Mary had got ready, and had put upon her babe, and when she laid the child in a rude structure, never intended for a cradle, other eyes than hers had observed the act, and were now proclaiming it, all unknown to Mary outside the town on the plains. The simple but pregnant message being now complete, there was a brief pause, and then... Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. They were invisible before. That is, the eyes of the shepherds had been held from seeing them. But now the pressure being removed, they see a multitude where but one glorious being had talked with them. Not only see, but hear. The heavenly multitude burst into song. Oh, that song! The only kind of song befitting the highest gift of reason the measures and cadences that open the heart to the highest fact, the fact of facts, the eternal wisdom and power of the universe in which all things subsist, the eternal Father, of whom and through whom and to whom are all things. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good will toward men. These words have been set to gorgeous music since, but who does not feel that the highest human effort must come as far short of the angelic performance as the nature of man is lower than the angels. The shepherds heard music that has not fallen on human ears since, except in the case of John, who heard, in vision in Patmos, the strains of the redeemed, assisted by an innumerable company of angels, and perhaps Paul, who heard unutterable things when, in visions and revelations, caught away into paradise. But the music will be heard again, and many times again upon earth. For the work that brought the angels to the plains of Bethlehem 1850 years ago is not arrested, but will go forward to the appointed climax when every knee will bow to the Bethlehem babe, no longer a babe, but the glorified sufferer, in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Of his kingdom there shall be no end, and in his kingdom There will be no sorrow, but songs of everlasting joy in which the angels will take effective part. It is interesting to reflect how much in harmony with human ways it was for the angels to communicate thus to the shepherds, how natural it is to communicate good news when you have it. The angels were full of interest at the arrival of the long-promised epoch in the purpose of God upon the earth. There is no evidence that... They were commanded to tell the shepherds of the fact. 
they appeared to have volunteered the information in the fullness of their own joy. Should we not feel moved to do the same if we knew anyone that would be deeply interested in news we had to tell? Man is in the angelic image and reflects angelic features in a faint degree. Making people glad when you can is godlike. The tidings the angels had to tell would not have made anyone glad. It would have no meaning to a company of Roman soldiers, for example. To Israelite shepherds who knew the scriptures, it was the best news they could hear. The choice the angels made in them is suggestive in another way. They did not go to Herod's palace, which was nearby. They did not go to the respectable Jewish rabbi of the city of David, where Christ had been born. They chose a company of lowly men, whose recommendation lay in this, that they were humble in their own eyes, and deeply interested in the promises of God. The fact is profitable to note, because the principle is an everlasting one and will shortly receive another exemplification when the angels arrive to announce the return of Christ. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, will hold good to the end. Not this class will be honored with the visits of the angels, but those to whom in all ages God's preference has been shown, the poor of this world, rich in faith. Having delivered their message, the angels went away into heaven. The shepherds would see them depart, mounting aloft and gradually disappearing from sight. We look with the shepherds and get a glimpse of a higher life than we know, yet one that has a practical interest for us, because we hope to be made equal to the angels. The angels, glorious in nature, exhaustless in power, immortal in life and strength, have the faculty of traversing the dizzy depths and boundless fields of viewless space at will. Their number is countless, their mission divine. The contemplation of the fact imparts a sublimer idea of the universe than is possible to those who suppose that the splendid heavens, a shining frame, exist for no higher end than the sustenance of the feeble orders of animal life that we know in this part of it. The universe becomes in Bible light a peopled arcanum of glorious and noble life whose vast aerial fields are but so many highways that can be traversed from world to world as the errands of almighty power and wisdom may require. To the unenlightened secular mind, this revealed fact is but a pretty fable. To the higher intelligence, it is the garb of inevitable truth. For it seems a necessary induction of reason that the splendid framework of heaven and earth must have within it a use and application equal to its greatness and glory, which could not be recognizable if life, as it is now upon earth, is the only form of it throughout its measureless fields. Having received a clue by which they might verify the extraordinary communication that had been made to them under the starlit and silent vault of heaven, while all the world was asleep, the shepherds repaired with haste to neighboring Bethlehem, to see, as they said, this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord had made known unto us. They were not long in finding Joseph and Mary in the virtual cattle pen at the inn. But where was the babe? Was it nestling in its mother's bosom? Was it snugly laid in the straw by the side of its mother? It was very likely to be so. It was improbable that the babe, especially such a babe, would be put in a place used for the feeding of beasts. But there it was. They found the babe lying in a manger, this was the conclusive sign to them. What more natural than that they should at once make known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child? This is Christ the Lord. All they that heard wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. It was natural it should be so. It is what would happen in any village at the present day. The people would open eyes and mouth and exclaim. The wonder would be but a nine days wonder, as it probably was at Bethlehem. Intelligence rests and feeds on wisdom. Ignorance gloats on the marvelous. It was a complaint of Jesus afterward. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Signs and wonders are valuable in their relation to the facts required by wisdom, but not otherwise. Mary was a more attentive and thoughtful listener to the sayings of the shepherds than the people about the place. 
Her knowledge qualified her to be so. She kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Her surroundings would indispose her to be communicative on the subject. Her state precluded it. And her position, amidst the bustle of a crowded inn and amongst people mostly indifferent and unsympathetic, would not encourage her to say much on a subject of which, although she knew more than anyone else at the time, she yet understood so little. Pondering them in her heart was the natural thing for her in all the circumstances. The shepherds were delighted. They had found things in accordance with the intimation made to them by the angels, and therefore felt the joy that was calculated to come from the confidence that this was the promised Messiah. They would look forward to the growth of the child and the manifestation of the man, with the anticipation that in a single generation at the most, the glory promised to Israel would be revealed in their midst. They returned to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Chapter 8 Childhood In seven days after the departure of the shepherds, the time arrived for the circumcision of the child, and circumcision was accordingly performed, probably in Bethlehem, by some official of the local synagogue. Why should Christ the Lord be circumcised? Because he was the seed of Abraham and of David according to the flesh. But why should that be a reason for circumcision? Because it had pleased God in carrying out his purpose toward the house of Israel, not yet fully accomplished, to proceed by covenant and to appoint circumcision as the sign of that covenant in all their generations. Any descendant of Abraham neglecting circumcision was outside the covenant, as God told Abraham, and would be cut off from Yahweh's regard. Jesus was a descendant of Abraham, and in a preeminent sense, the seed of Abraham, whose special mission it was to confirm or make sure the promises made unto the fathers. For circumcision to have been omitted in his case, therefore, would have been for the covenant to have been broken in its most essential application. But this failure was not possible. Therefore, the child, Jesus, was circumcised. His name was published in connection with the ceremony, according to the Hebrew custom. We are not told if it caused any surprise, as in the naming of John the Baptist. There was the same reason. There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. But probably... Joseph and Mary's acquaintances would all be at Nazareth, and so the family strangeness of the name would not be known in Bethlehem to the few who would be present at the performance of the rite. The fact remains in all its power that the name was not derived from the family pedigree, and that Jesus was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This fact is one of the many evidences of the divinity of Christ. The fact cannot be questioned, for it has been on record since the first century in writings of purity and truth, and is embedded in such surroundings as to be undetachable from the system of truth of which it forms a part. No other explanation of the name of Jesus can be given. Men may scoff and assert, but facts are not destroyed by that process. The concurrent agreement of the apostolic age cannot be disposed of. The very reason given for the bestowal of the name Jesus is sufficient to place it beyond the range of human invention. For he shall save his people from their sins. It is not according to the habit of men to be governed by so large and so pure an idea. Human enterprise or inventiveness runs in the channel of human sympathies and passions. The things that be of men are visible in all their ways and thoughts. But here is a reason that relates alone to the things that be of God, and is therefore self-evidently from a divine source. It was not a new name in the sense of never having been used before, but it was new in Mary's circle, and in her use of it to name her son, it probably received for the first time its true application, of which previous uses were the typical adumbrations. For as the least informed may be aware, it is a Hebrew name, 
in which the Creator's name is the leading ingredient, Joshua or Yahshua, Yahweh shall save. Yahweh saved Israel by Joshua, the successor of Moses, and again by Joshua, who took a prominent part in the restoration from Babylon. But in these cases, the work was transitory and performed indirectly. In the case of this newly born child, the work was to be forever in those for whom it should be effectual, and it was to be done in a direct manner by God himself, who was the father of the child, and who made him what he was, and dwelt in him by the Spirit, working and speaking through him, as Jesus repeatedly testified afterwards, and as indeed was manifest from the nature of his words and works. It was most fitting, therefore, that he should be called Yahshua, or Jesus. Also, Emmanuel, God with us. He was, without much figure, the Word made flesh. The wisdom and power and fiat of the Father become incorporate in a man of the house of David, that sin might be taken away, and the way opened for friendship, love, and life forevermore. In a little over a month after the circumcision, the time came to present the circumcised child to the Lord, as the law enjoined. Thirty-three days were required to run for the mother's purification and recovery, after which, in the case of a first-born son, it was needful to discharge the claim the law had on him. God slew the firstborn of the Egyptians on the night of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, on which event he established a memorial claim for every male firstborn of Israel to be sacrificed unto him afterwards, unless redeemed in the way appointed. This claim lay on Jesus at the very start of his life on earth, and from this, being under the law, he had to be redeemed, like every firstborn male child of Israel. There were two modes of redemption, one for the well-to-do and the other for the indigent. The first was by the sacrifice of a lamb, and if the mother was not able to bring a lamb, then she was to offer two turtles or two young pigeons. From Luke, it would seem that Mary offered the latter, from which we have an incidental clue to her position in life. The distance from Bethlehem to Jerusalem would be seven or eight miles, a distance not inconvenient for Mary after the lapse of forty days. The path lay through the beautiful mountainous district lying to the south of Jerusalem. On the back of a mule or ass accompanied by Joseph, she would perform the journey with her firstborn son, all undistinguishable in appearance from other firstborns, which might arrive at Jerusalem at the same time for the same purpose. How great the difference really was, Mary knew, though it is probable her very familiarity with the child in all her motherly offices would prevent her from having a very distinct sense of the difference. Arrived at the temple, she presents her offspring to the officiating priest, with the two turtles or two young pigeons, either brought with her from Bethlehem or, which was more likely, purchased at those seats of them that sold doves, which were afterwards so unceremoniously overturned by her babe grown to manhood. To the priest, it was an ordinary child, and he probably went through the ordinary routine with the indifference natural to official repetition. But it was not so with all. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, to whom it had been revealed that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This man was no carping theorist or idle lounger. He was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. To such only does God draw near in loving and revealing confidence. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and on the particular day when Mary arrived at the temple with her little charge, the Spirit had drawn him to the same place, with the intimation that one of the children to be presented that day was he upon whom the hopes of just and devout Israelites had been for ages fixed. We can understand with what interest Simeon would take up his position and watch the mothers who came to present their little ones. And when Mary, accompanied by Joseph, stepped forward with her child to do for him after the custom of the law, the Spirit, making known to Simeon who she was, 
the old man, with what must have been a cordial and emphatic movement, took up the child in his arms, to the surprise of all parties, perhaps, and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. It cannot but appear most fitting that such an incident should attend the official presentation of the newly born Messiah to the Lord. It was a new testimony from God to the divinity of Jesus, one of a series of testimonies divinely delivered at every well-marked stage of his introduction. First, at the conception. Then a few months further on, when Joseph was distressed. Then at birth. Now, at the presentation. Afterwards, at other seasons. The reasons for such a testimony will be apprehended when we realize that a foundation was being laid for faith in the most important transaction that had ever taken place among men. There was no aim to impart the kind of éclat that is associated in the popular mind with prodigies and wonders. There is a total absence of omens and auguries, no comets, swinging open of doors or unnatural occurrences, but the divine attestation was a necessity for the object in view, and this attestation was given at every stage and in chaste and suitable form. In this case, by the movement of the Spirit in an old man of the divinely approved type, whose utterances, though devoid of power to impress bystanders at the time, helped, at a suitable moment, to complete the divine endorsement of the work being done. Not only Simeon, but Anna, a prophetess of a great age, was used for the same purpose. She, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise to the Lord, and spake of him, the newly presented infant, to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. Joseph and Mary marveled at those things that were spoken. They knew that the babe was Christ the Lord, but they evidently had not the large views opened out in the prophetic utterances of Simeon and Anna. There was an element in Simeon's words addressed to Mary that would perplex and trouble them in the mere rudimentary knowledge they had. This child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. The expectations associated with the appearance of the Messiah were those of blessing and prosperity only. It must consequently have appeared a curious darkening in the midst of light to speak of Israel falling and of gainsaying against the newborn Messiah and a sword piercing his mother's soul. Events soon showed the meaning of these painful prophetic illusions, but for the moment they must have been of difficult significance to Joseph and Mary, and must have increased the obscurity inevitable to their partial comprehension of the transaction in which they were being instrumentally employed. It is by no means beside the point to note how signally the prophetic foreshadowings of Simeon have been realized. It must have appeared in the highest degree improbable that the helpless carpenter's babe which he held in his arms would affect public events in the land of Israel, or that such a child could ever have any relation to the Gentile world as a light. Looking back, we see how entirely the natural improbability has become historical fact. Though the world sits in darkness, we are eyewitnesses to the fact that the brightest name in Gentile estimation is the name of Jesus, and that what little alleviation of natural barbarism the nations experience in these civilized times is traceable to him, whose infant form Simeon upheld. We refer to this fulfillment of his words rather than to the fall of many in Israel that followed Israel's rejection of him, or to the cruel sword which his crucifixion plunged in Mary's heart, because the reader might feel that these events were too near the time of the prophecy for him to feel quite sure that the fulfillment came after the prophecy. There can be no such reservation on the subject of enlightening the Gentiles, though we have not yet reached the full enlightenment contemplated. Simeon's prophecy has been on record for over 1850 years, 
and the ascendancy and light-giving power of the name of Jesus is a fact before our eyes at the present moment. Whence this wonderful fulfillment, the word of Simeon? The narrative says, The Holy Spirit was upon him. This is a complete explanation, and contains within it a guarantee of the divine reality of all the rest. The result of any attempts to explain it on any other principle can only show by their weakness the truth of Luke's explanation alone. Joseph and Mary, having performed all things according to the law of the Lord, returned into Galilee to their own city Nazareth. So Luke informs us. Matthew seems to say they went to Egypt. Whence this apparent inconsistency? It evidently arises from Matthew omitting notice of the matters recorded by Luke, and speaking of a later occurrence. That it is a later occurrence of which he speaks is manifest from a comparison of the leading features of the two accounts. In the case of Luke, all that is recorded happened within the first six weeks of the Lord's life. In the case of Matthew, the period was sufficiently extended to make Herod go as high as two years for the maximum age of the children to be slain, two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. The details require a considerably extended period. It was when Jesus was born in Bethlehem that wise men came from the east. Their journey must have taken some time. They did not start till they had seen the star, and the appearance of the star coincided with the birth of Jesus, as would appear from Matthew 2. They inquired on their arrival at Jerusalem, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Their enquiry troubled all Jerusalem. This must have been a work of time. So must the summoning of the chief priests and scribes by Herod to ascertain from them the locality of the birth of Christ according to the prophets, and the departure of the wise men to find the child. All these things could not have come into the six weeks elapsing from the Lord's birth to his presentation in the temple. Therefore, they must have transpired afterwards. If it be asked, how could that be, seeing that the wise men found the child in Bethlehem, when, according to Luke, it had been conveyed to Nazareth? There are two suggestions, either of which may yield the answer. Either of them would allow a place for Matthew's incidents in the narrative of Luke, that is, either in Luke 2, verse 39, or between 39 and 40. The first is, that when Luke said, when they had performed all things according to the law, he only meant after they had performed all things, etc., without intending to indicate how soon after, and that, in fact, they stayed a while, during which they received the visit of the wise men, and then went to Egypt, and then to Nazareth. On this supposition, Luke simply leaves the Egyptian episode out of the record, as having been already fully narrated by Matthew, with whose gospel he would be acquainted before he began to write his own, giving prominence rather to details of which Matthew says nothing. The room for it, on this view, would lie in Luke's word returned in verse 39. They returned to Egypt on their journey, to which he deemed it superfluous to say anything. The other suggestion is that, if Luke meant that Joseph and Mary returned to Nazareth immediately after the presentation of Jesus in the temple, then they must have returned to Bethlehem some time afterwards, possibly to complete the business of the family enrollment. There is no record of a second visit having been made, but Matthew 2 is evidence of it, if they departed to Nazareth when Jesus was six weeks old, because it shows them in Bethlehem when he must have been an infant of months, according to the time which Herod had diligently inquired of the wise men. One or other of these hypotheses is necessitated. Either Joseph and Mary did not return to Nazareth immediately, or they came back from Nazareth to Bethlehem after having returned. A class of critics suggest a third, that is, that Matthew's account is an interpolated myth. But this is inadmissible every way. The mere existence of apparent difficulty does not justify it. And as for the omission of these chapters from certain early manuscripts, the circumstance is of no weight, seeing the omission was challenged as a corruption at the time of its appearance, 
See comments on the Ebionite and Hebrew Gospels of Epiphanes and Origen in the 3rd century. The manuscripts in which these omissions occur differ in other features from the received Gospel of Matthew and contradict Mark, Luke, and John in details with which the received Gospel of Matthew agrees. If they are of no authority in the other features, they are of no authority as to the first two chapters of Matthew. The received Gospel of Matthew is founded on the concurrent evidence of a great number of ancient manuscripts and versions, translations, supported by quotations made by the very earliest Christian writers, as well as by the internal evidence of the chapters themselves, against which no earnest man could place one or two manuscripts, which were pronounced mutilations at the time they appeared, and which bear internal evidence of interference on the part of those who compiled them for their own purposes. Those who compiled them rejected parts which they could not receive, for no other reason than their inability to reconcile them with their ideas of things. Consequently, to make the omissions in their documents a reason for omitting from ours would simply be to adopt their arbitrary prejudices against the weight of evidence. The only admissible course is to accept Matthew as much as Luke and find a place for both in the mutual adjustment of the circumstances they narrate. On this principle, we have to note the arrival of the wise men in Jerusalem while Joseph and Mary remained for a short time in Bethlehem after the presentation in the temple, or during their second temporary residence there, no longer in the inn, but in a house. Who these wise men or magi were need not be a subject of any concern. They may have been Israelites belonging to the deported ten tribes who were taken eastward. Or they may have been Chaldean students, with a smattering knowledge of the prophets and the hope of Israel growing out of them. In either case, they stood related to the truth. It may seem strange that a star should be mixed up with their inquiries after Christ. It looks as if they had been astrologers, but it may not have been so. The star they saw was evidently not of the ordinary heavenly bodies. It was neither a fixed star, a planet, nor a meteor. Its motion was local and slow and steady and subject to an intelligent guidance, which caused it to stand over where the young child was. This was a phenomenon entirely outside ordinary astrological occurrences. The idea that the star they saw was an appearance caused by the brilliant conjunction of leading planets at their perihelia, cannot be maintained if we are to accept Matthew's account, as to which we hold there can be no true question. An appearance so caused would not travel before the eastern visitors and locate itself over a particular house. The suggestion is particularly to be objected to on account of the implication associated with it, that is, that an unusual natural appearance was misinterpreted and exaggerated by the writer Matthew, and applied in a legendary manner to the events connected with the birth of Christ. There may have been a conjunction of leading planets about the same time. It would seem, from an astronomical calculation, that there was. But to call this the Star of Bethlehem is to beg the question. There is no reason why we should not take the narrative just as it stands. Its unusual or miraculous character need be no obstacle. The whole situation, of which it forms a part, was miraculous. The birth of Christ by a virgin, the introduction of Emmanuel upon the scene, the announcement thereof by an angel, and its celebration by a multitude of the heavenly host, the activity of the spirit of prophecy in Mary, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Simeon, etc. Surely all was miraculous, and why not a miraculous star, if to divine wisdom it seemed necessary or suitable? A cloud, which at night turned to radiance, went before Moses and the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Why not a star in connection with the work of the prophet like unto Moses? There is nothing to be said against it, except that it is strange and unusual, and apparently superfluous. But there is no weight in this against the testimony of Matthew, whom the Spirit guided into all truth, as Jesus promised. These wise men from the East were evidently God-fearing men on the watch for the Messiah, whom many beside them in that age were expecting to appear on the strength of Daniel. And this traveling star appears to have been given them as a sign. 
even if it could be proved that they were astrologers. This would not dispose of the attested fact that in this matter of looking for the promise, God had regard to them and communicated with them at a time when angelic communications on the subject were rife. Balaam was a soothsayer, and yet was the subject of true revelation on a certain occasion when appropriate use could be made of him. So the witch of Endor was used to make known the truth of... Chapter 9. From Childhood to Manhood We are not yet done with the circumstances of the childhood of Christ. We must follow him in his babyhood to Egypt, in his boyhood to Jerusalem, before we stand with him in his manhood on the banks of Jordan, and follow him in his fully developed divine teacherhood through the land of Israel for three years and a half. The inquiry of the wise men on their arrival in Jerusalem was, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? However strange such an inquiry appears in modern ears, after the long ascendancy of the artificial ideas of Christ that have become prevalent through ecclesiastical influences, it had no uncertain or inappropriate sound in Jerusalem, where the prophets were read every Sabbath day. The one foretold by the prophets, and of whose appearing many were now expectant, was to be a king, sitting on the throne of David, governing and dispensing justice from Jerusalem as a center of universal law, binding all nations in the bond of that political and social unity which all thinking men see to be so desirable, but to which none can suggest a practical attainment. The arrival of a band of men in Jerusalem, with inquiry as to the whereabouts of this coming one, and the implied intimation that he had been actually born, was calculated to produce the agitation that followed their question. When it became generally known, all Jerusalem was troubled. The report came to Herod's ears. It particularly affected him. He was the actual king of the Jews for the time being. His jealousy was excited by the reported birth of one long looked for by the nation as their heaven-sent head and king, destined to rid the earth of all rivals. His natural impulse was to get hold of the newborn king, if he could, for the purpose of his destruction. But how could he get hold of him? No one knew where he was. The inquiry of the wise men excited universal curiosity and surmise, but could find no answer. The wise men could only tell of the star which for the time had disappeared. They knew nothing of the locality where the mighty personage was to whom it pointed. In the dilemma, Herod had recourse to the chief priests and scribes of the people. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. Why should he expect them to know? because in their custody were the holy oracles which had been committed to Israel, and in which was shown beforehand the coming of the Just One. Herod must have been aware of this in a dim and traditionary way, before he would have applied to them for the information wanted. He would hear of it from time to time from his courtiers, or in his dealings with the people in various relations. It might be supposed that Herod's recognition of the prophetic character of the newly born child would have withheld him from the attempt he made to destroy it. It would have had this effect on a fully informed and tractable mind, but this was not Herod's case. He was an enlightened and headstrong tyrant who would class Hebrew prophecy with Greek or Roman augury, which could sometimes be circumvented. The chief priests and scribes of the people were able to supply the information desired by Herod. The categorical question, where Christ should be born, They met with the categorical answer, in Bethlehem of Judea. They did so on the strength of Micah's prophecy. Out of thee, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. It is interesting to note this frank and ready application of the words of the prophets. It is in strong contrast to the cloudy and bewildering exegetics of modern commentators of the Jewish school who inherit the demoralizing effects of centuries of rabbinical efforts to divert the indications of prophecy from Jesus of Nazareth. It is also a condemnation of the so-called Christian treatment of the prophets, which equally, with the Jewish treatment, though in another way, nullifies or makes them void by artificial and false canons of interpretation. 
Had Herod's question come before either the Jewish rabbis or the Gentile ecclesiastics of the 19th century, it would have received no such direct and explicit answer. The said authorities would have peered critically at the etymology of the terms, and finding that Bethlehem meant house of bread, would doubtless have suggested, in long-drawn, elegant sentences, that the term contained no geographical indication, but pointed to heaven as the great source of all life sustenance, and therefore of the Messiah as the bread of life sent down from heaven. That, in fact, no one could tell where Christ was to be born, or, for the matter of that, that he was to be literally born at all, as the prophecy might be taken as the foreshadowing, in a personified form, of the messianic age, to have its origin from heaven. Had the chief priests and scribes of the people treated Herod's question in this way, they might have been in danger of being treated as Nebuchadnezzar's astrologers and magicians were treated when they professed their readiness to interpret the king's forgotten dream, but their inability to supply a knowledge of it. But they had not yet become so sophisticated. They boldly answered that, according to the prophets, the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, which, as we have seen, he was, a fact that supplies a clue for the reading of the prophets in matters not yet fulfilled. Having obtained this information, Herod called for the wise men privately and ordered them to go to Bethlehem and search diligently for the young child, and bring him word when they had found him. To veil the dark purpose that he had formed, he told them his reason for wanting to get at the child was that he might worship him. The wise men, believing in their simplicity that Herod's statement was sincere, set out with all alacrity towards Bethlehem to find the object of their search. But how, after all, were they to get at it? They could easily inquire their way to Bethlehem, but how were they to identify one particular unknown child among hundreds, perhaps thousands, in Bethlehem? They might hear the report of it when they arrived, but they might not. And if they did, report might be conflicting. Their uncertainties were soon at an end. As they went along the road, lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. We may understand why, on seeing this, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They would now be able to identify the newly born King of the Jews without any doubt. It may seem as if it were not necessary that they should be able to do so. It might even seem as if it were expedient they should not be able to find him out, seeing that the aim of Herod, on whose business they came, was to destroy the child. A reconsideration may suggest other thoughts. In the wisdom of God it was evidently necessary for the wise men themselves that they should discover Christ, and their homage, at his cradle, was a part of the situation that it pleased him should attend the introduction of his beloved into the world. Consequently, to have concealed Christ would have marred his plan on these two points, and it would not, after all, have screened Christ from Herod's designs, as the wholesale slaughter of the sequel shows. Therefore, the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. They entered the house indicated by the stoppage of the star, and there they saw the young child and Mary his mother. They not only saw, they gave vent to the feelings which the sight was calculated to stir in them. They fell down and worshipped him. They also unpacked the treasure they had brought with them and presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. To this, some demur as a sentimental extravagance, out of keeping with the fact that Mary's child, though the son of God, was also the son of Adam, of a like nature with the rest of Adam's children. How little reason there is in this demur must appear on reflection. God said, centuries before, by Isaiah, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Now we learn from the Spirit in Paul that this homage was to be received by proxy, that is, in and through the Son of his love, who is the image of the invisible God, the express image of his person. At the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hence also, in the Apocalypse, they are conjoined in the ascription joyfully offered by the company of the glorified saints, to him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, was it not fitting that at the very commencement of the life of him who was to be the Father's representative and manifestation, there should be a recognition of the kingly majesty veiled and involved? The angels celebrated the event of his birth, and here we have the representatives of what was esteemed in that age the most honorable order of men upon earth, prostrating themselves in the presence of the child and offering costly gifts. It is fitting. It is beautiful. The impulse of all hearts in genuine sympathy with the work of God will be that if they had been there, they would have taken joyful part with the wise men's adoration of the babe in whom was fulfilled the heart-stirring prophecy, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, etc. Meditating a return to Herod, they are warned of God in a dream not to do so, but to depart unto their own country another way. They hasten to comply, and are well on their road, when another message comes to Joseph, ordering him to leave Bethlehem at once, with the young child and his mother, and to flee into Egypt, to remain there till fresh word came to him. The reason of this became quickly apparent. When Herod had waited long enough to be sure that the wise men had no intention of returning, he issued an edict for the destruction of the entire babyhood of Bethlehem under two years, in the hope of being able thus to compass the death of the object of his jealousy. This barbarous edict was thoroughly carried out by the willing instruments always at the disposal of a despotic government. Thereupon rose a wail rarely heard upon earth, the wail of a multitude of bereaved mothers. It is impossible to conceive acuter natural agony than that inflicted on the mothers of Bethlehem. As no human affection is stronger than that of a mother for her child, so no suffering could be greater than that caused by this cruel slaughter. Many have been the efforts of the pencil to depict the scene, various the success, tragic enough all, but doubtless none of them coming up to the reality. It is one of the most harrowing episodes in the story of human suffering, a long, dark, dreadful story. Then was indeed fulfilled, in its most literal and striking manner, that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation, and weeping, and great mourning. The primary application of this prophecy was to the removal of Israel in captivity from the land. But the richness and depth of the mind of God are often seen in two or more analogous coming events, being covered in the same prophecy. Had Joseph and Mary and the young child been in Bethlehem at the time, nothing short of a miracle would have saved the child from Herod's executioners. A miracle, no doubt, would in that case have been performed, but God does not work miracles unless they are absolutely necessary. He shielded his son from harm by having him removed beforehand. He has other sons who may hope for similar providential favor, for all his sons are precious to him. But another purpose seems to have been served by the descent into Egypt. It had been written in the prophets, Out of Egypt have I called my son. On the face of them, these words seem to be a historical reference exclusively to the exodus of Israel under Moses. But by Matthew, we are instructed in a deeper additional meaning. He says that Christ's residence in Egypt occurred that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. At first sight, it is difficult to understand how a historical allusion to the Exodus can be a prophecy with reference to Christ. So difficult is this felt to be that many Bible students have, in all ages, refused to receive it, and indeed have made it a reason, along with others, for refusing to believe that Matthew wrote the chapter where the statement occurs. But we have seen that this mode of solving the difficulty is inadmissible. Matthew wrote the words undoubtedly, and that, too, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, 
which rested on and guided all the apostles to the end, as Christ promised. The question is, on what principle can two meanings be conveyed in one form of words? It is not a question of two opposite meanings, or two dissimilar meanings, but of two cognate and related meanings in the terms employed by inspiration. There is a first and proximate meaning to all the facts and statements recorded in Moses and the Prophets, but was there not a secondary meaning, congruous to the first, not apparent at the time of the first meaning, but latent and left for future elucidation? However repugnant such an idea may be to limited human intellect, it is impossible to deny that such is the teaching of the New Testament concerning the writings of inspiration. That teaching is not confined to isolated instances like the quotations about the Exodus. It runs throughout the apostolic writings. It is peculiarly a New Testament revelation that there was in the scope of Old Testament events, institutions and statements, a meaning not obvious to those who stood immediately related to them. Of family incidents in the life of Abraham, Paul says, which things are an allegory? We should not have known otherwise. He tells us that in the law of Moses existed the form of knowledge and of the truth, that it was a shadow of good things to come, whose substance was of Christ. We should not have known this had we listened only to Moses. Christ speaks in the same way. He says that not one jot or tittle could pass from the law till all was fulfilled. He said he had come to fulfill it, and that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses concerning him. We should not have known that there was anything in the law of Moses to fulfill if Christ had not spoken thus, and Paul after him. There need be no difficulty about the fact when the fact is obvious. It is characteristic of high mentality, even in its human manifestation, to delight in analogies and involved meanings, to hit off two significances in the same expression. That this should prove to be an attribute of the eternal mind not only need be no difficulty, but it is both to be expected and will excite admiration. Analogy and type and double entendre run through the whole history of divine doings upon earth. Thus, the seed of Abraham covers the kernel of the seed, Christ. Thus Israel, firstborn nation, covers the firstborn son, Jesus. And a prophecy of the one is often a prophecy of the other. See Isaiah 49 and others that will readily occur. Thus also in Moses, Joshua, David, and Solomon, we deal with foreshadowings of Christ and read a prophecy of him in them. That Matthew should seem to strain prophecy is only an appearance. It is impossible to sympathize with those who would strive to remove this appearance by saying that Matthew did not write it, or that in writing it, Matthew was not inspired. The Spirit of God's own way is the best, and although its ways are often hard to see through, they improve with acquaintance and become more lucid and beautiful as we master them. Israel was the Son of God, as Moses was commanded to say to Pharaoh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Let my son go, that he may serve me. By this, Israel was a prophecy of Christ, as the plant is a prophecy of the flower. The two were connected. The one came out of the other. Israel became the Son of God for the working out of God's purpose in Christ, the ultimate and real Son and one pattern running through the whole work made it possible to foreshadow the one in the other, and make the one a prophecy of the other. In calling the one out of Egypt, the fact became, and was intended to be, a prophecy of the other, coming out of Egypt as well. For the one was the other drawn to a focus, as it were. The principle receives several illustrations. Topographical coincidences run through the whole plan. The offering of Isaac on Moriah required that Jesus should be offered there also. The birth of David at Bethlehem required the same thing of Jesus. David's flight up the face of the Mount of Olives from the presence of Israel's rebellion seems to find a counterpart in Christ's ascent from that mount from a nation that said, We will not have this man to reign over us. 
and David's return via that mount, a counterpart in Christ's coming back to the Mount of Olives, before his enthronement in Jerusalem. Israel scattering among the nations finds Christ so scattered in his body during all the times of the Gentiles. The holy portion of the land in the age of glory covers the place of Abraham's sojourn in the land as a stranger and David's flight among the rocks of Engedi, and Christ's trial, mockery, condemnation, and death. The divine plan is full of such interesting and fitting coincidences, among which we are bound to place the fact that not only the national but the personal Messiah came out of Egypt in the beginning of his existence upon the earth. Herod's death opened the way for that event. The angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead that sought the young child's life. In obedience to which, the little band returned from Egypt and made for Judea. Why Joseph should propose going to Judea, we are not told. It would probably be connected with the circumstances and acquaintances arising out of his previous visit to Bethlehem in connection with the family enrollment. At all events, on arriving in Judea, he found his way barred. Herod's son, Archelaus, was in power, and fearing that the son might retain the feelings of the father in reference to the young child, he went northwards and turned aside to Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, says Matthew, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. There is no prophecy in these terms to be found in any of the prophets. It is evident from the way it is introduced that it was not intended as a citation of express words. It is introduced as something spoken by the prophets. This is not the way an exact prophecy would be referred to. It is a way of alluding to some general sense of what the prophets have said. What have they said that would connect his name with Nazareth? This depends upon the meaning attached to Nazareth. There are two meanings, both of which would yield some analogy to what is predicted of Christ by the prophets. The first is that which is yielded by the Hebrew root of the name Nazareth, Netzer, though its primary meaning is to reserve, to preserve. It comes by derivation as a noun to signify a plant, sucker, or young tree springing from the old root and reserved or preserved when the tree is cut down. Therefore, a branch, as translated in Isaiah 11 and other places. A branch shall grow out of his roots. Scholars suggest that the reason of Nazareth being called by the name having this meaning was the exuberance of its foliage. However this may be, there was a fitness in the man, who was to be known as the branch of David, being brought up in a city having that idea in its name, however derived. It would in that case be one of the many correspondences with which divine ways and things abound, as we have seen, and Christ transferred to a place with such a name would be an incipient commencement of the fulfillment of the prediction that his name would be the branch. The second meaning would be found in the unfavorable impression conveyed to the popular mind in Matthew's day by a man being known as one brought up at Nazareth. This sense is expressed in the question put by Nathanael when he heard that the Messiah had been found in Jesus of Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was in poor repute. It was a despised place. To be a Nazarene was to be a despised man. Now this is what was spoken by the prophets that Jesus was to be, a man despised and rejected, a Nazarene in the sense attachable to the epithet at the time of Christ's birth. There is a third meaning for which there is something to be said, though its fitness is not so apparently complete as in the other two cases. That is, the possible correspondence of the name of Nazareth with the Nazarite law which prefigured Christ as much as all other parts of the law which have their substance in him. He was to be a separated and holy one unto God after the type of the Nazarite. And this general prophecy may have been taken as corresponding with the name of the city where he was to be brought up, or indeed, as required by the law of correspondences already glanced at, that he should be brought up in a city so named. Finally, it is possible that in the far-reaching and richly involved operations of divine wisdom, in the arrangement of these matters, 
the whole three meanings were intended to converge in the name of that particular spot upon earth which was to be honored as the mortal home of earth's immortal lord and owner. Chapter 10 In Preparation for Public Life The last chapter brought us to Nazareth. Very little is disclosed of Christ's life there during the time that elapsed to the day of his introduction to the nation of Israel. We have just one or two glimpses. First, we have a general view of the years of his childhood presented in these words. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This shows us a thriving, healthy child, and a child of well-marked character from the first, quiet, probably, and grave, but of clear, decided, and original mind. It must have been so in the childhood of a man like Jesus. It is said, The child is the father of the man. This is a universal truth, even in cases that may seem to be exceptions. The man is but the expansion and development of the germ existing in childhood. The pattern of the man Christ Jesus was latent in the child born of Mary. That pattern was the impress of the Spirit, the impress of God, the power of the highest overshadowing her. The Spirit took this part that it might do this work, for it was in order that there might be such an one as Jesus that the Spirit departed from natural methods and operated directly in the begettal of a child who was not the son of Joseph, except in family relation. It was of God that Jesus was made unto us righteousness, sanctification, wisdom, and redemption. With such an inception to his being, it was in a sense natural that his developing childhood should exhibit the strength of spirit and fullness of wisdom recorded by Luke. Till the age of twelve, there are no practical illustrations recorded of these mental characteristics. There was no need that there should be. The brief and chaste declaration of Luke sufficiently describes early years, which chiefly became interesting from the manhood that followed. Curiosity might have been gratified by personal details, but the mere gratification of curiosity never comes within the design of the Spirit of God's communications. What we are told is enough to illustrate its work in Christ. What uninspired men would have done with the narrative is shown by every biography that issues from the press, and most strikingly of all, by those apocryphal gospels which profess to give us particulars of the childhood of Christ. It is well for us to know that these productions have been repudiated by those having knowledge from the day they appeared, but this fact would almost have been unnecessary for us to be certain of their spurious character. The reading of them is sufficient to bring this conviction. The style of composition is weak and undignified, and the matters narrated puerile and absurd. For example, When the Lady St. Mary had washed the swaddling clothes of the Lord Christ and hanged them out to dry upon a post, the boy possessed with the devil took down one of them and put it upon his head. And presently the devils began to come out of his mouth and fly away in the shape of crows and serpents. Then the Lord Jesus, while a baby, answered and said to his mother, When thirty years are expired, O mother, the Jews will crucify me at Jerusalem. They went on to a city of idols in Egypt, which, as soon as they came near to it, was turned into hills of sand. There was a leprous woman who went out to the lady St. Mary, mother of Jesus, and said, O oh, my lady, help me. St. Mary replied to her, Wait a little till I have washed my son Jesus and put him to bed. The woman waited as she was commanded, and Mary, when she had put Jesus in bed, giving her the water with which she had washed his body, said, Take some of the water and pour it upon thy body, which, when she done, she instantly became clean. And when the Lord Jesus was seven years of age, he was on a certain day with other boys, his companions about the same age, who, when they were at play, made clay in several shapes, namely, asses, oxen, birds, and other figures, each boasting of his work and endeavoring to exceed the rest. Then the Lord Jesus said to the boys, I will command these figures which I have made to walk. 
and immediately they moved. And Joseph, whensoever he went in the city, took the Lord Jesus with him, where he was sent for to work to make gates, or milk pails, or sieves, or boxes. The Lord Jesus was with him wheresoever he went. And as often as Joseph had anything in his work to make longer, or shorter, or wider, or narrower, the Lord Jesus would stretch his hand toward it, and presently it became as Joseph would have it, so that he had no need to finish anything with his own hands, for he was not very skillful at his carpenter's trade. In complete contrast to this foolishness is the brief, pure, and comprehensive statement of Luke that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The incident of his thirteenth year shows us this process of growth far advanced. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Whether Jesus accompanied them on those occasions before he was twelve years old may be doubtful. The prevalent opinion is that he did not. This may or may not be a correct opinion. Probably it is incorrect. The law of Moses required every male to be present at the yearly Passover in the place which the Lord shall choose, and all the members of the household besides, thy son and thy daughter, thy manservant and thy maidservant. It is more likely that Joseph and Mary would act literally on this command than that they should yield a partial obedience. In that case, Jesus went with them every year from his earliest infancy. If, on the other hand, the reduced state of the Jewish nation under the Roman yoke was made a reason for a curtailed compliance with Mosaic requirements, then they did not take their household with them, but contented themselves with their own personal attendance, leaving Jesus and the other members of the household at home. However this may be, when he was twelve years of age, they took him with them to Jerusalem to keep the feast. And it was on this occasion that we have the first recorded exhibition of the deeply marked character of Jesus in his earliest years. According to the custom, a considerable company of kinsfolk and acquaintances journeyed together from Nazareth and neighborhood to Jerusalem. Other companies from other districts would repair to the holy city for the same purpose. The various roads through the country would be alive with joyous traveling companies converging upon Jerusalem for a six days holiday observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, concluding on the seventh day with a solemn assembly. Israel, in their dispersion, may be seen in our great cities striving to give some effect to this beautiful appointment of the annual feasts. They may be seen on particular days of the year streaming towards their synagogues. Alas, when they get there, it is only to go through a liturgy and listen to sermons about as vapid and lifeless as those of their Gentile Episcopalian neighbors. It is all that is left, meantime, of the glorious institutions of the past. In the days of Jesus, though the shadows of night were hovering on the horizon, the day had not quite departed. The beautiful land of promise sustained a numerous and stirring Jewish population, who, enjoying a quasi-national independence under Roman ascendancy, were at liberty to repair annually to Jerusalem to keep the feasts of the Lord as appointed. When he was twelve years of age, in the spring of A.D. 16, true era, he might have been found a grave and thoughtful boy in one of the companies passing along the road, leading through the plain of Esdraelon, and past Mounts Ebal and Gerizim towards Jerusalem. Beyond his quietness and reserve, there would be nothing to distinguish him in the eyes of a passing observer from other lads. Subject to his parents, he would help in this and that practical little matter as need arose on the road. Arrived in the holy city, the company would settle in quarters arranged beforehand and duly proceed next day with the exercises of the feast, in which the boy, Jesus, would take a more lively interest than was ever taken by boy before for he had a deeper sympathy with God than all that went before him or came after, and would enter with a deeper penetration and keener relish into the various associations of the Passover, both as to the history it brought to mind, and as to the foreshadowing it contained of the more glorious deliverance that the Father proposed to effect by himself. The remark he presently made warrants us in believing as much as this. The feast was finished, 
The concluding solemn assembly was held on the seventh day, and all preparations were then made for departure by the various companies that had come from all parts of the country. The things brought for use at the feast would be got together, baskets would be packed, bundles tied up, clothes and utensils put into convenient form for transport on the backs of animals. All being ready, the company to which Jesus belonged started on its northward journey homewards. Jesus did not accompany it. He tarried behind in Jerusalem. He tarried behind because of attractions. It was not the attraction of the shows that are usually to be found at all feasts and fairs, and which probably would be present in some form on those annual occasions at Jerusalem. It was not the attraction of games or sightseeing. It was the attraction of matters above the understanding and far beyond the sympathies of other boys, matters appealing to the interest only of the gray-headed rabbis of the temple and doctors of the law, matters connected with the work and will of God with man. He had got into contact with the heads of Israel, with whom he could converse on such topics, and he tarried behind while the procession of his kinsfolk and acquaintance moved forward on the road. His absence was not at first observed. The company was numerous, and Joseph and Mary would have enough to engage their immediate attention, perhaps younger children to look after. They supposed he was in the company somewhere. When they had been a day on the road, not noticing him, they asked after him, but could not find any one that had seen him. They went through the whole company, but found him not. They then began to be alarmed. Leaving the company to go forward, they returned to Jerusalem to seek him, sorrowing. Most parents have at some time or other experienced the pang of discovery that a child is lost, and will therefore be able to enter into the feelings of Joseph and Mary, as they vainly sought to get tidings of such a boy as this. For several days they were a prey to the agony of bootless search. They could hear nothing of him. They probably indulged in self-recrimination at not having made sure of his presence in the company at the time of starting. At last, after three days, they found him. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. They found him both hearing them and asking them questions. A boy of twelve, listening to gray-headed men on subjects having no interest for boys in general, and asking questions in reference to them. And not only so, but answering questions put by these same gray-headed men to him, and answering them with an intelligence that filled all who heard him with astonishment at his understanding. Extraordinary as the incident may seem, is it not in perfect keeping with the whole surroundings? Does it not seem perfectly natural that such a man as Jesus, so entirely beyond the range of all men, should have a boyhood differing from all ordinary boyhood? And that a babe, begotten by the direct action of the Spirit of God, should develop into a boy with a superhuman sympathy with divine things? The unnaturalness would have been in any other state of things. When Joseph and Mary saw him in the situation, they were amazed. The doctors of the law were in reverence with all the people, and Joseph and Mary doubtless shared the feeling, and would therefore experience a mixture of astonishment and fear at finding their boy right in their midst in free and fearless converse. Their joy at finding him would be for a moment checked. It was quickly known who they were, we can imagine the relaxing of the strained attention of which Jesus had been the object, and the turning of the inquiry of the learned doctors to the agitated parents. Is this your boy? Mary, with a mother's impulse, was the first to respond. Addressing herself directly to Jesus, probably laying her hands on him, she said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. This is the language of reproof. The distress, that was the uppermost feeling while as yet he was lost, had given way to the sense of annoyance at having been put out so much trouble by his neglect to be in his place. Is not this true to nature everywhere? The boy answered with such a fascinating mixture of innocence, beauty, and depth, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Apparently, 
he did not or could not enter into a distressed parent's point of view. Another view, invisible to most men, absorbed his eye. His father and his father's business filled his field of vision. The circumstances and exigencies of this ephemeral existence, which are all controlling with merely natural men, were of small consequence in his estimation. Nothing is more prominent in his after life and teaching than this state of sentiment. It is a sentiment having reason as its basis, and that, at last, more or less, infects and affects all true disciples of Christ, with the result of their being misappreciated by the people of the present world. However, the time had not come for the complete assertion of his character and mission in this respect, and so, surrendering to the eager affection of his sorrowing and reproachful parents, he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. The next eighteen years of his life are shrouded in obscurity, nearly amounting to total darkness. There are one or two dim rays of light. The first of these consists of the words, and was subject unto them. This brings before the mind the daily routine of domestic life, with its quietness and simplicity, as the sphere of the boy Christ's upbringing, instead of in the stirring and ceremonious surroundings usually provided for those who are in training for a throne. Part of that quiet routine would consist of work at the bench when he was old enough. We may gather this from the questions of neighbors afterwards. Is not this the carpenter? He learned his father's trade while subject to his parents at Nazareth. We all know this, but how feebly the fact impresses us, except when we happen to get a glimpse of it in its right connection. It is best seen from the point of view of Christ's exaltation. An unexciting, lowly life of private manual labor was chosen by God as the right school for the training of His beloved Son, for the heirship of all things. How comforting this must be to Christ's lowly brethren of the poor of all ages, who have to earn their bread by the labor of horny hands. Rightly viewed, it will reconcile them to their present lot as the best adapted to develop true human character at its best, when other conditions are favorable, and as the best preparation for the exaltation to which all men are invited who accept his Son. To think of the coming King of all the earth having been a working man. What curious thoughts it suggests. Working men are looked down upon by the children of plenty, and, lo, a working man is destined to divest them of their wealth and send them empty away. The life of a working man means the full development of manhood's strength, a strong frame, a firm and kindly muscular hand, a simple and independent character combined with humility of deportment. If to these we add the clearness of a divine intellect, the fire of a godly zeal, and the tenderness of true kindness and compassion, we get an approximation to the carpenter of Nazareth, in whom God was working out the archetype to which his family would be conformed. Such a training would give personal strength and plainness of appearance. The word of prophecy had said, When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And probably, had we seen Christ in the days of his flesh, we should have seen such a man as the children of this world would not be likely to fancy. Plain, grave, absorbed, noble withal, but the nobility of earnestness and purity and conscious communion with God, not the showy nobility that makes a man popular, not delicate and refined, but manly and strong. That he had great strength of constitution was shown by his endurance of the incessant fatigues of a three years and a half daily ministry. He would be a Jew of the best type with a Jewish look. The woman at Jacob's well recognized him as a Jew. The portraits of Christ that have become current are all fanciful. Most of them are after Gentile models. Some of them may resemble him on some points, but it is more likely that we shall find him a totally different looking man to anything represented by them. We shall be more than satisfied we know, and there we may rest. It is not the person of Christ in the artistic sense that has been presented for our love, though that will be lovely enough. It is his character and the great things that center in him as the truth. 
Still, it is well, in the exercise of a little common sense, to get rid of the conventional fogs in which the subject has become obscured. Another ray of light shines from the remark of townsmen about Christ's relations. He was in Nazareth on one occasion, after he had commenced his public work. We are told they were offended at him, that is, they stumbled at his pretensions, on account of their familiar knowledge of him. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses, of Judah and of Simeon, and are not his sisters here with us? It is no great exercise of imagination, in the light of this piece of local knowledge, to picture Jesus, between twelve and thirty, mixing in a busy family circle, and, as the eldest brother of the family, taking a prominent part in various domestic matters common to them all, yet differing from them in the intensity of his character and the gravity and earnestness of his demeanor. This difference would not be apparent to them. A stranger would have distinguished him from the rest by his reserve and seriousness amounting to sadness, but we know that daily contact familiarizes the mind with even the extremest peculiarities, and therefore, as a member of the Nazareth community, Christ would simply be known as the quiet, pensive son of Joseph, without challenging recognition as the greater than Solomon. The time was coming for his manifestation, but, till thirty, he was simply one of the inhabitants of Nazareth. The last reliable clue that we have to his life in Nazareth is contained in a single but significant expression. We are informed that after his baptism, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. From this, we gather that he was a regular attendant at the synagogue and took part in the exercises conducted there, especially that one exercise of which his whole life was a glorification, the reading of the scriptures of Moses and the prophets. It was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, working the six days with his father, though there is a tradition that his father died while he was young, and that the business and family affairs had to be carried on by him. He rested the seventh day according to the commandment, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, but calling the Sabbath a delight, holy of the Lord, honorable. We are not to infer from this that Jesus paid no attention to the words of God on the other days of the week. On the contrary, he was obedient in all things, and therefore carried out the other instruction of Moses to Israel, to treasure the words of God in their heart, talking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, binding them as a sign upon thine hand, and as a frontlet between thine eyes, riding them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. Jesus would have the fear of God before his eyes all the day long. He would therefore in everything give thanks. At his daily meals, God would thus be recognized, as well as when he came to feed a multitude and to institute the breaking of bread. Could we have followed him in his business transactions, we should have found them conducted with gravity and sincerity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. And in his social intercourse, we should have found no jesting and foolish talking which are not convenient. We should in everything have found him an example. He is the ideal to hold up before us. The ideal is blurred and defaced by popular thoughts. We get back to the original by the scriptures, and not by the disquisitions of the schools. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. God's favor never left him, but man's favor did. Not, however, while he was a private resident of Nazareth. He was liked so long as he was a passive, guileless, and obliging neighbor. But when he began to point out in public teaching that the ways of the people were wrong, aversion took the place of favor, and he became an object of positive hatred. This was not till a considerable time after the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. In that year, chapter 11, On the Banks of the Jordan and in the Wilderness. 
The work of John the Baptist had been some time in progress, when Jesus cometh from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. The nature, object, and upshot of that work we considered fully in chapters 4 and 5. We now note the fact of Christ's entrance upon his public work and his introduction to the nation of Israel occurring in connection with that work. Christ is first seen in the act of submitting to the ordinance of baptism at the hands of John the Baptist. Many have wondered why he should have been baptized in view of the association of baptism with repentance and the remission of sins. There is no real occasion for quandary. There was a need for some circumstance or situation as the occasion for Christ's manifestation to Israel. And John's institution of baptism, first made an object of public attention in the way exhibited in chapters 4 and 5, was provided for this purpose. Secondly, there was a fitness in Christ's submission to that ordinance in view of the work he had come to do. Nay, we may go further and say there was a necessity. The work he had come to do was, first of all, a work of obedience in himself. By one man's obedience shall many be made righteous. He learned obedience by or in the things that he suffered. Now John's baptism was a matter of divine command. We have seen in the chapters referred to that it was no adaptation by John of a previously practiced ceremony, but an institution of direct divine appointment. Consequently, submission to it was obligatory on every faithful Israelite. Its observance was part of the obedience which Christ rendered. He had to be obedient in many things, for he was made under the law, which imposed many duties, to all of which he had to conform in the process of extricating the faithful from the dominion of the law. He had to be obedient even unto death. But he had to be obedient also at the hands of John. Without this submission, the righteousness he wrought out for repentant sinners would have been incomplete. Hence, it is easy to understand his response to John's demure to baptize him. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Whatever God appoints to be done is righteousness in the doing of it. For this reason, Christ's baptism in the Jordan was part of the righteousness he developed. But why, it has been asked, should he who was sinless be called upon to submit to an institution which was for the remission of sin? We need not ask this question. It is sufficient if God required him to submit to it. But the question will be asked, rejoins the curious, and there ought to be an answer. Well, and there is an answer. Although Jesus was not a transgressor by his own action, he was partaker, for the time being, of a sin constitution of things. He was born into a state that was evil because of sin and he partook of all the evil of that state, even unto death itself, working in the nature he bore as the son of Mary. It was to open a way out of that evil state for man that he was made of a woman under the law. The way had to be opened conformably with the divine principles involved. A beginning had to be made with himself as the foundation on which other men could build. In the first instance, as the son of David, the son of Abraham, he was as much subject to the reign of death, established in Adam's race by sin, as any of those he came to redeem. His mission was to break into this reign of death by obedience, death, and resurrection, illustrating and establishing God's righteousness in all its bearings. For his sake, men's sins were to be forgiven. Therefore, he was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In view of all this, it was not incongruous. On the contrary, it was in beautiful harmony with his work that on the threshold of the public phase of it he should be called upon to submit to a ritual act which symbolized the putting away of sin. After his baptism, Jesus was impelled by the Spirit into a neighboring wilderness, one of the many wild and untilled spots with which the mountainous country of Judea abounded. We are not informed which of them it was. It matters nothing at all which, but curiosity has naturally speculated, and is probably not far wrong in fixing on the precipitous bluffs standing in the midst of a scorched and arid desolation on the southwest of Jericho, overlooking the Dead Sea. 
This is a little to the south of the spot where John's baptismal operations are believed to have been conducted, and would be a fitting locality for the purpose of Christ's spirit-enforced seclusion. The purpose was that he might be tempted of the devil. Paul says, He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. His temptation in the wilderness must, therefore, come into the category of our experiences. This at once excludes the popular idea that it was the supernatural, personal devil of popular theology that tempted Jesus. No man is ever tempted in this way, but always by the incitements of the flesh, either operating spontaneously within, or presented to us in an objective manner by the suggestions of a person external to ourselves. The whole narrative of the temptation shows it was a temptation of the latter sort, a temptation brought to bear by an external tempter, a person, but not the popular Satan, who exists only in the papalized imaginations of such as derive their theological ideas from inherited tradition and not from the study of the scriptures. The Bible devil and the pulpit devil are two different things. The Bible devil, with many shapes, has a common derivation, the insubordination of flesh and blood to divine law. This devil exists in his largest form in the present political constitution of things upon the earth. In detail, he presents himself in our own feelings and in the persons of those who, on any pretext whatsoever, would draw us away from divine ways and thoughts. Who he specifically was in the case of Jesus, we are not informed and do not know, but his generic identity is unquestionable. It is an idle question that has been raised by theologians whether Christ was peccable or impeccable in view of the fact that he was driven into the wilderness expressly for the purpose of being tempted of the devil. If he was not capable of sinning, he was not capable of being tempted. A popular writer has well said, Some in a zeal at once intemperate and ignorant have claimed for him, Christ, not only an actual sinlessness, but a nature to which sin was divinely and miraculously impossible. What then? If his great conflict were a mere deceptive phantasmagoria, how can the narrative of it profit us? If we have to fight the battle, clad in that armor of human free will which has been hacked and riven about the bosom of our forefathers by so many a cruel blow, what comfort is it to us if our great captain fought not only victoriously, but without real danger, not only uninjured, but without even the possibility of a wound? It is facts, and not the metaphysical theories of facts, that wise men concern themselves with. Metaphysics land a man in the inconceivable. We have no faculty for dealing with the abstract. We cannot follow God, as it were, in the process by which he has concreted his eternal spirit into the forms and functions of created life. It is the practical relations of the latter that concern us. On this principle, it is sufficient to note that Christ was tempted, without inquiring whether or not it was possible he could yield to temptation. The speculation only becomes material, and that in a bad sense, when it is made to interfere with that free volition of Christ, which was essential to the righteousness he came to fulfill, the very nature of which consists in the willing and witting subordination of the human will to the divine. Not my will, but thine be done. The time at which the temptation occurred is suggestive in several ways. It was just when Jesus had been openly acknowledged by the Father as his beloved Son, and when the Spirit of the Father had visibly, and without measure, come upon him, with that endowment of power and wisdom which qualified him to perform those works and speak those words beyond the power of man, which, for three and a half subsequent years, filled Judea and Galilee with his fame. Why at such a time, and not before or later in his career, was he driven of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Jesus himself afterwards proclaimed it as a principle of divine action, that to whom much is given, of them much is required. This seems to supply the answer. Jesus, endowed with a special measure of the Father's favor, 
was sent forth to be put to a proof equal to the new greatness conferred upon him. He had been, during a thirty years' private life at Nazareth, subjected to the temptations common to men. Anointed now with the Holy Spirit and with power, it was meet he should be subjected to a correspondingly increased test of faithfulness before going forth in the plenitude of this power to bear the Father's name before Israel. He was tempted in three particulars only, but it will be found that they comprise, in principle, all the temptations to which we can be exposed. First, there was the proposal that Jesus should illegitimately minister to his own need in the matter of food. The temptation on this point was made as keen as it was possible to be. It was not brought to bear when Christ had eaten. It would have been no temptation had the proposal not coincided with a strong desire in the direction proposed. It came to him after a fast of forty days, when the Spirit, having sustained him all that time with the supply of the vital energy ordinarily derived from the alimentive process, permitted him to hunger. As the proverb has it, hunger will break through stone walls. Even lawlessness committed from the force of hunger is leniently viewed by men in general, as it is written, Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. The hunger of Christ, therefore, made the temptation a very strong one. But the temptation was made still stronger by the way the tempter put it. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. This was as much to say that the proof of his messiahship required him to do what was proposed, and that if he failed to do it, he would give his tempter ground for doubting the proclamation that had just been made on the banks of the Jordan. Thus, Christ's desire to testify the truth was cunningly brought to the help of his hunger to incline him to provide himself with food. But the power to make bread at will, which Christ possessed, as afterwards shown by his feeding a multitude with five loaves and two fishes, was not given to him to provide his own natural wants, but to exhibit his Father's name to Israel. Consequently, though he had the power which the tempter challenged, he was not at liberty to put it forth at the time and for the purpose proposed. It would have been sin in him to comply with the suggestion. He repelled the suggestion by a quotation from the Scriptures, which involved the assertion of those facts. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The power of this rejoinder may not at first sight be manifest, because, so far as appearance went, the proposal was not to discard the word of God, but merely to provide the bread, which the answer recognized as an element, though not alone, in the process of living. If we understand, however, that the proposed mode of providing it was wrong, the strength of it appears. Bread alone will finally land a man in the grave, because bread cannot bestow immortality. Bread, with the word of God believed and obeyed, will be a stepping stone to life that will never end, and it is in this sense that the scriptures speak of men living. In fact, in this connection, bread becomes part of the pathway to eternal life, for without the bread first, to develop and sustain the natural man, the word of God could not have the ground to work on which leads to everlasting life, first that which is natural, afterward that which is spiritual. But bread, with the word of God disobeyed, is bread alone, so far as life-giving power is concerned. For the word of God confers no everlasting life on the disobedient. Consequently, for a man to obtain bread on terms that involve his non-submission to the word of God, and this was the tempter's proposal, is to take his stand on bread alone. To such a case, the scripture quoted by Jesus has obviously a most forcible application. The rejoinder was unanswerable. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Here we have a different class of temptation. 
In the first, he was invited, for two powerful reasons, to make a forbidden use of power entrusted to his hands. In this, the tempter goes to the other extreme and invites Jesus to throw himself ostentatiously on the promises of God. This, perhaps, was more difficult to meet than the other. It was as if the tempter said, Thou art the Messiah, art thou not? Yes. It is written, is it not, that he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and they shall bear thee up? It is so written. Cast thyself down, then. How canst thou expect me to believe if thou dost not? How was this to be met? By the assertion of a principle ignored in the tempter's application of Scripture, a principle which all divine promises presuppose, and which would have been violated by compliance with the tempter's challenge, that is, that there must be no familiarity or presumption towards God, that we must make a wise and full use of all that he has put in our power, and that divine help is only for the need that remains after there has been a humble, wise, and loving employment of the means already in our hand. This principle Jesus asserted by quoting Scripture, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Had he thrown himself down, as the tempter proposed, he would have done what the Scriptures thus forbid, and would have forfeited his claim to the promise to which the tempter so sophistically appealed. The protection promised in that promise was protection from evil beyond control, and not from evil rashly and presumptuously incurred. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Here the temptation takes a different direction. Having failed to induce Jesus to illegitimately gratify the cravings of the flesh, or to transgress in the direction of presumption towards God, the tempter tries the effect of present honor, wealth, and exultation offered on the simple condition of doing homage to the offerer, as the kings and governors of the Roman earth were in the habit of doing to Caesar, for their position and dignities. Jesus utterly repels the suggestion, reminding the tempter that the scriptures command one service only. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The temptation of Christ is a remarkable episode in a remarkable history. It deserves more attention than it receives as regards the lessons it conveys. There is no temptation that can come to us but what was in principle involved in the specific temptation to which he was subjected in the wilderness after his baptism. The consideration of his resistance to the suggestions of the tempter will help us in all our exposures to similar trial. Is it proposed to us to gratify some craving of the flesh in a forbidden direction? To make a vainglorious or presumptuous use of spiritual privileges? To obtain temporal advantage by paying court to the enemies of God in any form? Let us cast our eyes to the wilderness of Judea and remember the principles asserted by the Lord in Scripture quotations in answer to similar proposals. It is also a remarkable feature of the temptation of Christ that he employed the scriptures in repelling the suggestions of the tempter. This is a feature worth noting in a day like ours, when the universal tendency is to give the scriptures a less and less commanding place. With Christ, the fact of a thing being written was a sufficient reason for making it a rule of conduct, which is becoming less and less the case in a day when more and more the theory finds favor that the scriptures are partly or wholly the product of human thought, subject to human judgments and conscience as to the obligation of its precepts. The implication is obvious that we only stand with Christ fully when we recognize that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and therefore, as he said, cannot be broken in its truth or authority. Corollary to this line of thought is the view which the temptation affords of Christ's acquaintance with the Scriptures. His ready responses to the tempter show both acquaintance with them and that memory of their practical instructions that was able to apply them in the hour of need. If Jesus thus knew the Scriptures, it was because his custom was 
to frequent the synagogue and read the scriptures. His being God manifest in the flesh would lead to a powerful proneness in a scriptural direction, but it did not make him independent of the testimony, which the Spirit in David says was his study all the day, and the understanding of which made him wiser than his teachers. In Christ, therefore, we have an example of that endeavor to become familiar with the scripture and daily reading, which is the characteristic of the modern revival of the truth. We have also, in his treatment of them, a justification for regarding the scriptures as the unerring source of information in matters pertaining to God. Jesus was in the wilderness forty days, at the end of which the temptation occurred. We are not informed in what manner the Lord was occupied during that time, or for what purpose he was so long a time secluded with the wild beasts. We can scarcely escape the thought that it was for preparation. He had come straight from the home associations of Nazareth to John's baptism, and it would scarcely have been fitting that he should at once have passed from those associations into the wide public work which he had to accomplish before his death. We all know the need for pause and changing from one occupation to another. How much more must he have felt it who stepped from a carpenter's bench to the position of a nation's instructor with the power of God upon him and the work before him of taking away the sin of the world? Doubtless, he had to strengthen himself that made such a transition easier for him than for ordinary men. Still, as touched with the feeling of our infirmity, he must have felt the effects of village life sufficiently to make it needful that he should have a season of majestic and heart-enlarging solitude before entering upon his journey through the multitudes of Israel as the name-bearer of Yahweh. The length of the period brings to mind many similar periods in the work of God. In years, we have Moses in exile forty years, Israel in the wilderness forty years, the land in frequent rest from affliction forty years, David's reign forty years, Solomon's reign, forty years, etc., and etc. In days, we have the flood descending forty days, Moses in Mount Sinai, forty days, the spies searching the land, forty days, the Philistine defied Israel, forty days, Elijah in the wilderness, forty days, Jesus, forty days with his disciples after his resurrection. The recurrence of this number suggests that it enters into the plan upon which the purpose of God with the earth is being worked out. Forty days were, at all events, a sufficiently long time to prepare the heart of Jesus for the work upon which he was about to enter. When the temptation was ended, Jesus came into Galilee. The enemies of the Bible make a great deal of the apparent discrepancy on this point between John and the other gospel narrators. Matthew, Mark, and Luke I'll speak of the temptation as occurring immediately after Christ's baptism in the Jordan, while John not only omits the temptation altogether, but appears to represent Jesus as remaining in the neighborhood of the Jordan several days after his baptism and departing thence to Galilee. The explanation of this is to be found in the nature of John's account as distinguished from the others. It is not a chronological biography, but a report of special sayings and discourses of Christ for which there is only so much of circumstantial narrative introduced as is needful for a framework. There is no doubt some truth in the tradition that John's gospel was written last, and not only last, but long after the others had been in circulation among believers. Its existence is doubtless due to the perception which John had of the necessity there was for a fuller exhibition of the sayings of Christ in confutation of the erroneous ideas about him that had sprung into activity with the course of time. So much as was already well known, he would naturally think it superfluous to write, and the Spirit was with him to guide him direct. Therefore, the temptation, three times already recorded, he would omit, equally with the particulars of his birth. But, says the cavaler, he ought not to have contradicted the other accounts. He ought not to have represented Christ as in the neighborhood of the Jordan, in departing to Galilee during the forty days he was in the wilderness? The answer is, John does not do so. He only appears to do so on a rough reading. 
he does not record the baptism of Jesus. He only records the Baptist's remarks about it, and these remarks were made some time after it had occurred, for they are descriptive of its having occurred. How long after does not appear. It may have been some weeks. It may have been long enough to give time for Christ's forty days' absence in the wilderness. True, it speaks of Jesus coming to John the same day, but may not this have been after the return of Jesus from the wilderness? If the place of temptation were, as believed, to the south of the place of baptism, it would be natural that Jesus, on his way to Galilee, which lay to the north, should repass the scene of his baptism where the Baptist was still at work with the multitude. And what more natural in that case than that the Baptist, on seeing him again, should say, as John represents him saying, Behold, the Lamb of God! I saw the Spirit descending from heaven, and it abode upon him. It is evident that Christ's baptism had happened some time before, in which case there is no discrepancy at all between John and the other recorders, but merely a different order of narrative.